When I was a kid, we had a cat and mouse game going on around Christmas time, and it involved looking for gifts. My uh, my brother and I, we uh, wanted to know what was coming down the line. So when we were little, we would start, you know, clambering around and sneaking and peeking. And uh, we found, you know, my parents weren't very creative in the beginning. They would just shove stuff under the bed. And we never really looked for the gifts in order to, like, so to play with them. We just wanted to know they were there. In fact, if we found a bag of stuff, we didn't even open it. We just were like, okay, we got we got something coming. We found the stash. And uh, so the bed was the common spot. My father was not very creative. He used to shove things in a closet and then like put a blanket over it. And it was so obvious. So, uh, uh, and, and every year my parents were kind of figuring out, well, they're, they're looking around for their stuff. And one year they, they were like, well, we're going to take it back to the store. And we're like, they're not taking it back to the store. We're gonna, we, we called their bluff and, and got away with it. But, uh, but then it became this, this kind of this game that was being played, whereby my father would figure out more and more creative ways to hide the stuff. And we would go, go sneaking around, and, and you know, he thought he had us. You know, because we lived in this ranch, and there was a, uh, a crawl space up, up top. And uh, there was these rickety steps that came down. They were on like these retracting, uh, you, know, you pull the cord and they kind of slide down. And uh, it was late one night and I heard the steps creaking. And I'm like, oh, I know where they are. And uh, you know, my, fa my father thought he had us fooled. And the next morning I look at Steve, I'm like, he was up in the attic. He never goes to the attic. He hates the attic. So, uh, and sure enough, they were there in the attic. And uh, you know, the next day uh, my father's like, uh, you know, talking and, and I'm like, hey, how, how's things in the attic, dad? You know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so they, he got more and more clever with it because he knew we were always looking. And uh, one year, he just totally blew it. It was the best. He hid all of the, the stuff in the trunk of his car. And he figured, oh, they're never going to go in there. I've got the keys. You know, I drive to work. And, you know, so he had the gifts with him. Well, it was like two days before Christmas. We went shopping in his car. And we're all standing in front of the trunk. And uh, all of a sudden, my father completely forgot that all the Christmas staff was in the trunk. He pops the trunk open, and we're like, oh! oh. <laughs> and uh, oh, he, my my mother just, you know, he didn't hear it until the <laughs> for the rest of the afternoon. But uh, uh, probably one of the most clever ones, though, was we had this this uh, garage, and above the garage there weren't any steps to get up there, but there was a few pieces of plywood and everything, and uh, he figured he could sneak up into that little loft above the garage with a ladder and hide all the gifts up there. Well, we noticed that the ladder was being moved quite a bit in the garage. We're like, that's it. That's the spot. So, uh, you know, as soon as my, my parents were gone, you know, Steve and I we were climbing, and there they were. We're like, oh. So the, my dad came home. I'm like, gee, dad, what's going on above the garage this time of year? And he was like, what are you doing? You know, and he was ready to. So, uh, so it was just the ongoing. But there's that, there's that side of us that wants to know things. And little kids want to know stuff. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm still like that to some degree. And uh, I don't go looking for things anymore. Uh, but uh, uh, the bottom line is, is that we have an inquisitive nature. And what we see here in Hebrews is God gives us a peek. He, he gives us this little glimmer into the identity of who Jesus is, this gift that he is giving to us, to all of humanity. And Hebrews 1 outlines that gift. And we've been studying the fact that we are heirs uh, and that Jesus is an heir. Uh, we're co-heirs with Christ. Uh, last week we were looking at uh, uh, the fact that uh, we have God as, as creator. And we see here in this next passage of Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, uh, that there is this reflection of who Jesus is that helps us to understand the Father. And it's very powerful. Let's take a look here. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 tells us this. God, after he had spoken long ago to the fathers and the prophets and in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And that's where we left things off. And this is where we're going to pick it up. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And we'll stop right there because there's actually so much in just one sentence. Uh, I'm going to expound upon it for a little bit this morning. Uh, in Hebrews 1.3, we have really three things that are said in just a, a short, uh, short sentence. It tells us here that he is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of who he is. That speaks volumes to us. Uh, 
And we need to take a moment here to stop and look at what he's speaking of here. When we find that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, he is undiminished deity. He is fully God. And what we find here is this idea of radiance is light. It's brightness. It's this effervescing power. And we find that Jesus is equated with God in these, in these terms. Uh, and we see this theme throughout the entire corpus of the Bible. Uh, we, we find that we have the motif of light and darkness. Darkness representing sin and evil and wickedness and Satan. And light, of course, representing purity and life and God himself. Uh, the scriptures uh, explain this very clearly. And I'll, I'll share with you just one. Uh, John 1.4, in him was life. And the life was what? The light of men. And we find here that light is a, a major motif, even following the Christmas story. Uh, if we were to follow a more traditional a liturgical uh, a program for Advent, uh, one of the typical themes that would crop up in that is light. Uh, and just talking about light and light in the Bible and how God is the light of our lives. And we find here that when we talk about light, uh, darkness needs to flee. It tells us in John 1.5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot even comprehend it. Why? Because it just flees from it. Uh, darkness has to do with covering things. Light has to do with exposing. And that's very important for us uh, because we find here in the Bible that light is critical for us. Uh, the psalmist reflects upon this. Your word is a lamp to my feet and what? A light to my path. Uh, so we find here that in Messiah we have illumination. We have the glory of God being revealed and we have this ability to understand how to walk and how to live our lives. Uh, Augustine said it very, very beautifully that through the light of God our spiritual eyes of the soul are opened so we can understand what's right and what's wrong what's good and what's bad. How we make our decisions on a Monday morning when we get out of bed and we're thinking to ourselves, what do I do? How do I deal with the conflict at work? How do I contend with my three-year-old who's driving me crazy? How do I take care of an aging parent? How do I deal or work through some problems at work? All of these decisions, these crossroads we come to, require some sense of illumination. And this is where we see Messiah steps into your life and mine by illuminating and giving us that light. We also find here in the passage that he represents the being of God. Now this idea of representing, the word in, in Greek is actually character. We, same as we say in English. A character. And, and sometimes when you think of a person who's a character, like, oh, that guy's a real character, you know? And, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're kind of funny or kind of crazy or something like that. You know, every, every town has a character. And uh, I, I remember one character here in our town, I would be driving down, he'd be sleeping on the side of the road. And, you know, that guy's a character, you know? And he'd be walking around. And, uh, but, but when we think of character in, um, in a biblical sense of the word, the word uh, character in Greek, uh, it is more or less, and this is going, coming back to a, a major Christmas theme that I enjoy, is cookies. Um, many of us have, have cookies, and, and we use what? A cookie cutter. And what does that cookie cutter do? It, it, it shapes. It, you, you, you have your dough, you roll it out, and you take your cutter, and, and you make uh, an imprint in it, and you pull out the, the cookie, and what does it do? It looks identical to what you just cut into the dough. You have a little gingerbread man, maple leaves, or all, all sorts of other little critters that, that we make. And, and that, that's the idea here of being a character. That one imprint, one almost like a die being struck into a piece of metal, is now representing and is the exact representation of another. That's what we find in Jesus. He's not just light, but when you see the Son, you see the Father. And you've, you've heard those old sayings, you know, the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree, you know, or the chip off the old block, you know, some of these uh, euphemisms we have. What, what do we, we know what we're saying when we say a person, you know, father like son, something like that. And, and we, we witness this all the time. Have you ever called up somebody? And you're on the phone and you're like, oh, I'm talking to so-and-so, and you're talking to their kid. And it's like, wait a minute, put your mother on the phone, you know? And, and, and sometimes kids are, are really good about it, and they, they go along with it, and, you know, you, they fool you for a bit. But, but they have the same vocal patterns. There are some people, you, you, you look at, you know, families, and it's like, oh, my goodness. You, you know, the, there's these molds, and everybody just came out of this mold. They're all the same. 
And, and this is what we find here, this, this picture of being a character, is that when you see the Son, you see the Father. Now in ancient times, especially, if a king wanted to communicate with another king in another country, it was not uncommon to send the Son. Because the Son would represent the Father. And this is exactly what's happening here. This representation. It tells us who being the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. Upostasos is the idea here in Greek. And when we talk about his being, it's he is fully God. And he's also fully man. The word normally is translated into confidence. That when you see one, you have confidence in the other. Have, have you ever uh, gone into a bank or been involved with uh, the notion of being a power of attorney? When, when somebody has power of attorney, uh, you, you, you know, yeah, I, I wasn't looking for a hand, but thank you though. Uh, when somebody has power of attorney, what, is, what does that mean? You act on the behalf of another. You have the legal authority, the legal right, to sign a check, uh, to sign a document, or perhaps uh, to carry on some sort of business transaction. That's what's taking place here. That the Son, as an image, in the image of God, fully God, representing God, displays the power of God. But he's also man just the same. And this reflection is the reflection of the Father. How often do people say to us, well, I wish I could see God. If God would just show himself to us. If God would just step in and, and reveal himself. Well, he has. Through his Son. And this is why we find here, when Jesus prays at the end of his days, he's in the garden, he cries out, his great priestly prayer in John chapter 17, he says this, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So what we find here is that as the Son steps into time and space, he represents the Father in every aspect so that we may know God. It brings us right back to what we find here with Philip's question. Show us the Father, he says, and that'll be enough. Well, you're seeing him. You're seeing his character. He is holy. L listen to what Jesus says here in uh, John 8, 46. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He, he asked the question, can anybody convict me of sin? Can anybody say anything that you've seen me go out and do that would be wrong? And no hands go up. That, that wouldn't happen with any of us today. But we find that the, the character of the Father, which is holy, is reflected in the Son. And, and so we understand something about God by virtue of what we see in Jesus. Listen to what uh, Hebrews 4.15 says. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet what? Without sin. So we see just this one element, using these two verses as, as proof texts, confirm to us that, that the Son is the exact representation of the Father and is holy. His words, the same thing. Listen to what uh, we find here in John 17, 6. So Jesus answered and said, My teaching is not my own, but his who sent me. Again, that reflection. Jesus didn't come up here and say, well, I'm going to make a few stories up in some parables. No, no. He is conveying what the Father has relayed to him. His words, his character, also in terms of his deeds. Listen to what John 4.34 says. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish what? His work. His plan. His miracles. His love. His salvation. <laughs> So what we find here is that when Philip raises this question, going back to our reading today, and says, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, I have been so long with you, and yet you have come not to know me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. 
How can you say, show us the Father? And what we find here is a radical shift from the God of the Old Testament to the God of the New. In the Old Testament, when you talked about seeing God, I mean, people were scared to death. People who saw, they thought they were going to die. Uh, when there was a theophany, when there was a, a visible manifestation of God, people were just quaking in their boots. I mean, uh, the Mount Sinai and the whole Ten Commandments, I mean, nobody wanted to go near him. Because he was revealing his grandeur and his power and his glory and his might and his capacity to just reign over everything. And, and, and people were scared. People understood God through, through ritual and through feasts and through sacrifices. And, and, it, and it, was, it, it was a very rote type of a lifestyle. When we flip over to Jesus coming to us, the story changes radically. And what we find here is a relationship. Not just a religion, but a relationship, a personal relationship with the God of the universe and his creation, which is us. There's a story years back of uh, a group of missionaries that had come together and they were talking about producing some literature to distribute uh, in and amongst their given fields. Uh, there was some from Europe and several from the United States, a couple from South, uh, South America. And there's this one a mission couple from Africa who showed up. And they were all together and they were discussing you know, how uh, they were going to produce some, some pamphlets and tracts and booklets and things like that to bring out onto the field. Well, uh, they, they were talking about all this and the missionary from Africa was just shaking, shaking his head. Don't get it. Why do we need this? And, and finally, everybody in the group looked at the missionary from Africa and says, well, why, why do you seem so adverse to the idea of producing these things, you know, to, to tell other people about Christ? You say, no, that's not how we do it in our villages in Africa. No. When we want somebody to learn about Jesus, we just send a couple families in who are Christians. And they live amongst them. And then they see what it means to be a follower of Christ. They represent the king. And that's what we find here when Jesus comes as Emmanuel. He visits us and he shows us the Father. I love what uh, John Cairns, uh, principal of uh, Presbyterian uh, Divinity Hall in Edinburgh, once wrote. He had a teacher, his name was Sir William Hamilton. He writes this about his teacher who left an indelible mark upon his life. Listen to what he says. I do not know what life or lives may lie before me, but I know this that to the end of the last of them, I shall bear your mark upon me. That is what, as Christians, we're called to do. But more so, this is what we see in the Son. Emmanuel, God, is with us. So what does this lead to us? We have a very simple application, and that is this. Know him. The application we extrapolate from all this is that we are called to know the living God. Paul, twice in Ephesians, prays that they may know the height and depth and breadth of his love. He prays that they may know who he is. His whole prayer revolves around the knowledge of who God is. This could be our New Year's resolution right here. We can make it before we even step into the New Year, before we even step into Christmas. And that is what? To know God. We can know him through his creation. We can know him through providence as he's opening and closing doors and moving pieces on the grand chessboard of life. We can know him through conscience, but more so we want to know him through his word and through worship and through his son. That's how we come to know him. Coming together as a church body, committed to growing in the love and knowledge of our Savior. Serving. You want to learn a lot about God, step out of the boat and start walking into a ministry. That's how we come to know God. But to be committed, especially, to learning about the Son. I had a professor in seminary who used to tell us all the time, every year I take time to study the Gospels. It's part of my, my, my personal devotions. And I, I've, I've followed th suit the same for 25, almost 30 years now. Every year, I commit to reading through the Gospels. Why? I want to learn more about my Savior. If I'm going to know God, I'm going to see him right there on the pages of the text. How he works, 
how he interacts, how he cares, how he's gracious, how he's holy, how he's righteous. All of these wonderful attributes come jumping right off the pages that have been recorded for us so we may know God. Now, here's why it becomes so significant for us. Out by the, uh, where I, I live over behind the hospital, and we have a, uh, a set of nesting uh, eagles, bald eagles live out there. And uh, just the other day, I saw one swooping right by. They're, they're so majestic. I, I love eagles. And uh, I learned something about eagles uh, a couple of years back. They have a very unusual mating ritual. The female eagle is about 20% larger than a male. So uh, they're, uh, they're, they're just a little bit bigger. And when a female eagle is ready to mate, they only mate for, with one. They're monogamous. One, one for a lifetime. They, they, will not, uh, they will not depart. They're, they're faithful to one another. And uh, as they prepare for mating, the female eagle will do something very unusual. She'll fly around and look for, for some potential, potential mates. And when one seems to take an interest in her, and they seem to know this, they have some natural proclivity toward understanding, now's the time, the female eagle will go out and will grab a branch, a stick, and will fly way up into the air. And it will hover around with that stick in its talons and then drop it. And she'll watch and hover over to see what the male will do. If the male goes after the stick and tries to catch it, drops it, doesn't, she'll have nothing to do with that male. She will wait for that male to, to, to grab the stick and fly around with it in its talons for a short while. But that's not enough for her. After she sees this, if, if the male passes the first test, they call it the stick test in biology, that eagle will go out and find a bigger stick. And she'll take off as high as she can and fly around that male for a little while with that big old stick in her talons. And then at a given moment, she'll drop that stick once again. And as that stick has fallen down, she'll watch to see if he's going to catch that stick. And if he drops the stick, if he misses the stick, he doesn't go for the stick, she's done with him. She'll do that not once, not twice, but three, maybe even four times. The stick gets bigger and bigger. I'm thinking to myself, we got these eagles flying around my house. I want to move my, I have a, a cord of wood, all right? You know, they could just get it right on the back deck and I'll be very happy about this deal. But nonetheless, this is what the eagles, the, the female eagle will do. And biologists have been wondering, why in the world would she do such a thing? She wants to know if she can trust him. Because you see, when an eagle has eaglets, a mother eagle is probably one of the most ferocious mothers out there. You think mama bears are rough? A mama eagle, once those ch uh, ch uh, chicks are, are, are hatched, she will sit on them. No matter what. And it, they, they, they incubate for a while. She has to keep them warm. But once they hatch, they require a massive amount of food. Now, a mother eagle will not leave the nest. Very protective. In fact, they found eagles, mother eagles, in, in nests. They have burned to death. They've been in fires. They would not abandon their chicks. They're, they're that protective. She knows her life and the life of the eaglets are on the line if the male doesn't produce the food. Little eaglets, just a couple of them in a nest, require up to five fish a day. They grow like 500%, you know, from the time they're hatched until the time they're just even, even a little bit bigger. They, they just, they mushroom overnight. She needs somebody who's going to go out there and get the fish and get the food. So she wants to know she could trust the male to do his job. And that's why they do the stick test. That's why that knowledge is so important. And this is the same thing that holds true with God. The more you know, the more you understand and comprehend, the closer the relationship comes and the easier it is to trust him when your life is falling apart. I knew a situation years back took place in a church. There was this couple. They, they were what we call casual Christians. They'd come in Christmas, Easter, you know, maybe read the Bible a little bit, maybe not. Very laid back, very laissez-faire. Well, 
the, the wife ends up getting cancer. And her lives are falling apart. They're overwhelmed. They're filled with anxiety. They're struggling through all this. The pressure's on. They're stressed to the max. They don't know what to do. Their lives are, are just in complete shambles. Because they don't know their Savior. That relationship has not been cultivated and developed. They didn't really take the stick test too well. Right around the same time, there's another couple, same church, same scenario. The wife gets cancer. Her, her cancer is worse than the other one. And they face it with confidence. They face it with a sense of, of uh, understanding and peace that God has this whole mess under control. And what was the difference? One had developed that relationship. They had dug in. They had the roots. They had developed the trust over time. And yes, it's difficult. And yes, it's a struggle. And yes, they are facing perilous moments. And it's painful. But what separated these two families was the knowledge of God. One knew the Lord and was walking with the Lord and had cultivated and invested in that relationship for years and the other just kind of flew by the seat of their pants. And that's what made all the difference as they went through the difficult time. So as we face the new year, as we look into Advent, as we prepare for Christmas, I want to encourage you to know God. To cultivate intimacy with him. To delve deep into his word. To spend time in Bible study and in worship and in serving. Because in doing so, we see and understand and get a peek, more than a peek, of the Father. Let's pray.